Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live. I'm Joe Lynch. This is the state delegation update for February 25th, 2021. I am so pleased to be joined today with the newest of the state delegation representatives, Representative Erica Idahoven. Erica, welcome to your first trial by fire here on, great, on uh, Somerville Media Center. How are you? I'm doing great. How are you? And thank you so much for having me. Very good. Representative Idahoven was first elected in November of 2020, and she is filling the vacated seat by former state rep Denise Provo. She is the 27th Middlesex District representative, which encompasses a full swath of city of Somerville. So you've got your hands full with us, Erica. <laughs> That's right. No, I'm very excited. I'm very uh, pleased to, to be representing uh, such a wonderful community here in Somerville. So is it everything or more than what you thought it would be entering into the halls of Beacon Hill? Yeah, it's um, it's everything and more. It's it's really um, truly public service is such an incredible honor, right, and responsibility, um, and and something that you know, especially, I mean, we've been through so much, right? Even just in the past month and a half since I've been since I've been inaugurated. I mean, we've had the vaccine rollout. I mean, our neighbors are facing really serious. Um, issues around unemployment, healthcare access, um, all that, as well as right the the whole process of of legislating and and filing bills, right? And the people you you meet and you work with, you know, with folks who who really work on the ground on a lot of these issues, um, community organizations. So all of that, you know, I mean, I had a a flavor of that, right, as an advocate before I came in, but like you know, as as a state rep, I mean, it is truly just such a, an immensely um, it's difficult but rewarding work, right? And that you know, it's 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 incredible to to be able to help constituents meet their needs. Um, that is incredibly important, as well as you know, fighting for these bills that we need to see on Beacon Hill. So, and and working with my colleagues to to fight for bills that have come before me. So, yeah, it's been it's been quite a ride. I've looked at I've looked at your website on the mm -hmm. um, official website yeah. for the Commonwealth, and you have filed a massive amount of bills. Yes. So I'm going to say I'm going to make a statement here that you had pre-planned uh, prior mm -hmm. to announcing, you know, what you were going to be doing in terms of running for the open seat. And you had all these major plans up until probably around March 10th of 2020. <laughs> and a lot of it, you had to adjust a lot of those based on the middle of the pandemic. We're still a year into it. It's amazing to me that in March next month, coming next week, yeah. that we will be one year into this mm -hmm. pandemic and the crises that has touched everyone. Yes. So definitely. what kind of things have you had to reprioritize a little bit during pandemic? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, particularly with the pandemic, so my, one of my biggest issues is raising progressive revenue so that we can fully fund education, healthcare, housing, transportation, all our big needs, as well as a livable climate, right? So all the work we need to do in terms of getting to, you know, net zero um, carbon emissions. Um, those were all issues before the pandemic, but the pandemic has heightened them, right? So just to give an example with housing insecurity, it has doubled, if not tripled, right, in terms of the need. So we need that funding now. We needed it before, right, the pandemic. Affordability was a problem, right? Displacement, gentrification, these were all huge issues in Somerville. But now with the pandemic, it's been magnified, it's been multiplied, right? And so I, I take housing as one example, because that is, is a very big issue here in Somerville, but that's the same with food insecurity. It's the same with education funding, right? Especially if we're gonna open our schools safely, we need to be funding. Right, to enable that we can update our infrastructure, that we can ensure that we can bring on more educators, we can you know, safely reopen in a way that is actually just and, and, um, and, and healthy for our communities. So those things have all, it's, if anything, it's those issues were all there, right? With many of these issues before the pandemic, they were all present with us um, and they were crises just as much before the pandemic, but with the pandemic, they've been exacerbated and further exposed, right? Um, so some of these issues around affordability you know, for perhaps some people didn't know about it or, or see it, and now it's it's very much in our, our community spaces. Well, so that's, it, yeah. The affordability affordability issue may not have been touching them personally, 
Mm -hmm. Correct. That's right. So, yeah. so what's happened is those who identified affordability, whether it be housing or cost of living, those folks understood yeah. What it was. Oh, yeah. We now have so many more people who have been thrown into the crisis because they've lost their jobs or their yeah. income has decreased or, you know, a, a yeah. number of issues. And with that comes if you lose your job, you, you may have lost your in, entitlement to um, my words, the Cadillac of healthcare, care. Right. And you've been thrown into a situation where you can no longer afford you know, whether your, your, your business offered COBRA or whatever, mm -hmm. you're now finding yourself staring in the face that original crisis yeah. that people were talking about, but you really couldn't identify with it. Yeah, exactly. And I'd say but for some communities too, it's been a crisis they've been dealing with. And then now it's just gotten so much worse there. You know, before it was fear of losing their home, but now it's like you're facing eviction, right? And so I think, and that's, I think, especially the case, particularly with our, you know, our diverse community here in Somerville, communities of color, right, have been dealing with this. And in, in many ways, the COVID crisis, you know, we, we had health equity problems before the, the pandemic. And now, you know, when you look at the map, right, in terms of um, how COVID has hit, even across within Somerville, right, that, that, that those, those health inequities have been really just turned up in a, in a profound way. Let's stay with that for a little bit, Erica, because I did see that you, one of the bills you were filing was mm -hmm. on equity. Mm -hmm. So if, if you can set the stage a little bit and I might have a couple of follow-up questions. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I think a lot of, um, did you have a bill in mind or, I mean, I can speak on kind of generally what, which, you know, equity in general, right? Which is, you know, the, the, the way um, um, it touches just every issue that we, we deal with, but. Yeah, I think it more ha had more to do with the public health emergency mm -hmm. and how equity has still left people behind. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll just take one example because it's something that I've been advocating very uh, vigorously along is, you know, the vaccine rollout, just as an example, right? Um, you know, the fact that Governor Baker has really heavily relied on a, a privatization um, network rather than, right, relying on our public health infrastructure, right? relying on you know, the Public Board of Health in Somerville or CHA, right? Instead of doing that, having these mass vaccination sites is just one example of the inequities. When you think about who are the most vulnerable people in our society, right, who are over 75 or over now 65 with multiple comorbidities and then saying, just get on the T or if you don't have a car, right, just, just figure it out and get over to Gillette Stadium or Fenway Park. I mean, that's just completely out of the question versus what we could have had if we did rely on our public health infrastructure is, you know, CHA Somerville is knows where, you know, our most vulnerable um, residents here in Somerville are. We can, we can set up a vaccine station um, at public housing. We could go and, you know, go straight to where people are or set up a vaccination site right here in Somerville and then provide the transportation, right, through the city or through the, the other, you know, Somerville, Cambridge Elder Services, right? We have that infrastructure. Or, or Erica, let yeah. people walk to or a walk, place right. they're yeah. familiar with. <laughs> Right. Exactly right, and a, and a, or go to the primary care physician that they usually go to, right? I mean, there's just ways that we could have rolled out this vaccine in a way, and I'm I'm just naming examples of transportation equity, right? Never mind, right? There's language equity, so you know we need to reach people in the languages they speak, and as we saw with the vaccine rollout, and the website was already difficult enough if you spoke English as a first language. Never mind, right? Having to get that information um, to our you know our diverse community, so you know th that's just one example, right, of this public health crisis and the inequities that have been exacerbated. And then even with our solutions, right? When you look at who has been able to access the vaccines, there are people who have, you know, members of their family who are able to take care of them and bring them yet, you know, by their private vehicle to, to these vaccination sites. But there are many people who don't have those privileges. And that's just one example, right? Of, of, of privilege and, and equity and that's how it's manifesting itself. So a quick follow up on that. Do you think that Governor Baker, because you're not the only one to, yeah. to weigh in on that, mm -hmm. um, the mayor of Somerville has yeah. criticized the, the governor's rollout, um, other mayors of mm -hmm. inner city or, or communities where there are such huge gaps in, in fairness. Yeah. Do you think the governor did that purposely or do you think he was too much relying on mm. a quick fix for the vast number of 
people rather than looking at people who have the most need? Yeah, I mean, I think the, I mean, in terms of the intentionality, I can't speak on that. But what I can say is that, you know, we have a Republican governor, right, who believes, who does not believe in our public goods. Um, there is a reason why he is relying on, you know, private companies and contractors who have no track record of being able to reach our, our communities or no track record of, of executing us because he doesn't believe in our public health infrastructure. Um, you know, he has never said he was, you know, as a candidate, right? Like that's been pretty clear from the get go. And, you know, that the same thing applies when you look at, you know, public transportation is another great example. Let's talk about, you know, major public good in our, our society. He's cut services. Now, I don't think that those cuts were necessary and they are in, that's another example of inequity, right? In terms of who is being able, who, who relies on public transportation still today and now who is being disserviced by this and chipping away at that public good. But then in the meantime, right? When he was cutting, he was making cuts to these services. He also enacted a fair transformation um, capital investment, which is nearly a billion dollars so that we can collect fares more efficiently. It largely went to, again, to a private contractor. I mean, he's doing exactly what we, we elected him to do, right, as a Republican governor. Now, I have major disagreements, right, as you can probably tell from this interview, that I don't agree with what he's doing. But this is why it's so, so important in 2022 that we don't elect a Republican governor and that we elect a progressive governor right to to the state because this is, these are the consequences we are facing and particularly right our public health infrastructure public transportation and now our public schools are all under attack um through his policies and whether that's intentional or not that's i think something he never denied he would do either when he ran so your contention is is that a democratic governor could do a much better job mm -hmm. versus charlie baker the way he's done it Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a narrative we need to break through, right? That he's this sort of reasonable Republican. It's like, when you look again at these equity issues, these are not reasonable. These are incredibly harmful to our, our communities. Not that either one of us are, are a psychotherapist, but uh, <laughs> why, does, why does this governor have such a high rating across Massachusetts? He doesn't necessarily have mm. such a high rating within certain mm. segments of the Democratic Party, yeah. but why does he have such high ratings? Oh, that's a very good question. I mean, I think it comes down to, unfortunately, state government is in this weird in-between space from local government and federal government, particularly around media. And that's why Somerville Media Center is so, so important, right? And, and news outlets like this are so important, particularly around local media, um, because that is something that we've really lost a lot of, right? And we've faced a lot of hurdles and, and funding um, for local media that I think that is what leads to these poll numbers that don't reflect right the action. And then also, I think if most people understood what was happening, I don't think we would see these poll numbers. But you know, you have federal government that is constantly on TV, right? It's very easy to get access to that information. And you've got local government, which is um, it's more in our our lives, right? Like especially if you you know, longtime resident in any community, right, knows who their city councilors or you know town meeting members are, and so they engage with them on this you know very local micro right level. But state governments in this weird in between space where you know even when I was campaigning, I would talk to people and they'd say, "Wait, sorry, can you explain to me what your role is? Like I don't know what it is." And what, I would say, "Oh yeah." What yeah. is a state rep? What is a state yeah. rep? Yeah. So you know my you know my answer was basically you know we have a similar government at the state level, like you see in the federal level, and we have the equivalent of a president, which is the governor, and then you have the legislature, which is the Senate and the House, and I represent someone in the House, one of the 160 members. But that alone, right, is not common information. And so, you know, that that's where I think that state government really rests in this weird in-between space that is a, a lot of folks don't have either knowledge or access to, or don't feel the you know agency to be able to engage right. in that space meaningfully. Right, and thank you, uh, you know, thank you, grateful for the compliment, but that's what we've been trying to do during the pandemic by yeah. inviting in the city council president, the state delegation and the school committee, because they tend to get lost in mm -hmm. the communication system where you're only hearing from the governor, you're mm -hmm. only hearing from the mayor. And through no fault of their own, they have a communications apparatus that's right. been built. The yeah. state house really does not. 
Mm -hmm. um, and people have to depend on reporters calling you and saying, can you give me an interview, yeah. right? So the vehicle that we're trying to use, and thank you again for the compliment, is to make sure that people understand what roles the different forms of government play. Mm -hmm. you, came into, um, you came into this Michigas of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do what they elected me to do, and yeah. then all of a sudden you had to take a left turn into the middle of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But your original comments here on this show is the pandemic has ripped off the Band-Aid Mm -hmm. that we have put on these types of, of issues for a very, very long time. Yeah. One of the things that you are tackling is transparency, mm -hmm. is how are decisions being made, who's making them, yeah. and how much does the public get to weigh in on those things? Yeah. So my, my question is, how many times have you had a virtual lunch with the new Speaker of the House? <laughs> um, I, have, I have actually got to meet with him in person. This was back in, in the fall. Um, but otherwise, right, it's been through caucus and, and all that. But yeah, it's been, I mean, it's certainly, I will say, um, you know, there's a lot of challenges with uh, legislating in the COVID pandemic, right? And one of them is that, you know, we're not able to meet in person. Now, fortunately, um, you know, I've been able to go into the House for formal session twice. Um, but, you know, largely that was because I was speaking on um, an amendment and the other time I was being inaugurated, right? So that that is a chance to meet with legislators, but it is a, a pretty big hurdle, right? When we're all remote um, and to be able to to exchange all the, you know, conversations that we need to exchange so we can push things forward. That is certainly is one of the big challenges and, you know, certainly something that the session prior to mine had to learn and deal with. And then, you know, we're learning as well as we, we enter this new New so transparency versus, mm -hmm. you know, the the uh, hallway conversations yeah. that most politicians have, most yeah. elected officials, you do a lot of business in the hall, mm -hmm. you do a lot of business over the phone. And then when it comes to the public demonstration of your work, that's all in the public. Yeah. One of the things that has always been uh, frustrating for me from the state level governance mm -hmm. is who's in, who's out. Who has influence? Who doesn't? Mm -hmm. So we we depend on you as the state yeah. rep, one of the state reps from Somerville, to help us fix problems at the state level. Yes. And I, I want to kind of shift quickly into a very local level. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Later on this month, there is a new group um, that has been formed here in Somerville called Safe Streets Somerville, mm -hmm. and yeah. their initiative is to push for programs and fixes. Um, that will make pedestrian, bicycle, vehicular, um, public transportation to make all of that fit within this warren of streets that we have called mm -hmm. Somerville. Yeah. There's only so much land, Erica, you know that. There's only so much room. People are pushing their own agenda. One of the things that we depend on here a lot is our state reps to help us get the fixes at the state level. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that this group is looking at is there have been four deaths within the confines of the city of Somerville. The problem comes in is when they say that, they don't necessarily give the detail. And the detail is that three of those deaths have occurred on state controlled roadways. Mm. So how do we get more responsiveness from the state level through our electeds on Beacon Hill? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really great question. It's such an important issue around, you know, Safe Streets Initiative. And that's something that, you know, for us, I mean, it's our role, right, to work with the administration and really push them to say, hey, look, we need to have these changes and really take this conversation out of, um, particularly around road safety, right? I think we have a tendency just due to the nature of the issue to see it as like, oh, these are one-off incidents. But they're not, they're policy issues, right? These are systemic policy issues. And so when you have three out of four deaths coming out of these state controlled roadways, um, that's just what, one example of where this isn't just one tragedy or two tragedies. This is something that we are making a choice to let happen um, year after year and we need to change that. And I think that that's something that um, you know, definitely organizing these these community initiatives is so, so critical, right? Because we are, as representatives, bringing that voice to, to the administration. Um, and without that voice, right, it's just, you know, we don't want to turn it to a Erica or Mike or Christine have a good idea. That's not good enough. We need, you know, the community support around that. And so I think that's something that 
you know, definitely having this initiative, right? And then having the backing of city councilors, you know, mayors and all that all coming together to say, look, we need to make this change. Um, and we're really the conduit that enables and, and advocates for those changes to be made and right and to fight for those um, at the state level. And it's it's one of those things where, you know, we just have to keep pushing for right and talking to the right people in the state house to to really make it happen because you know there's oh, you know that was a seven thousand bills there's land taking there you know there's all these little things that like the administration can kind of blow off and be like you know this is not that important so it's our duty right to make it a, an, an important issue to them and that's something that you know that's our responsibility and of course that will always come down to collaboration mm -hmm. with the other members of the yeah. house because right. they all have their priorities. The mm -hmm. priority for the state rep in the city of Springfield is not the same priority yeah. that Erica Idohoven has. Yeah. So it brings me back to transparency. How good are you at the art of the deal in the hallway versus <laughs> what you <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I, I'm putting you on the spot that you no, you're have, fine. You've no, only I mean, had it... two months. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> well, I'm finding that, you know, what's really important is building relationships. Um, and I think that's what's really important is not just building relationships, but building relationships across the aisle, right, across the political spectrum. Um, that's been a really big priority for me. And again, it's only been uh, a month and a half or two months, right? Um, but, you know, it's been really critical for me to make sure that I'm building relationships regardless of where we stand. Um, and, you know, my philosophy is always uh, be hard on ideas and soft on people. Um, and so, you know, we can have, you know, we want to build those relationships so we can have these debates on these important issues, right? And we might differ, right? I might, I think we'll definitely differ, right, around school funding or progressive revenue and all that. But having that relationship in place to say, look, we, we at the end of the day, want the same thing for our constituents, right? We want our constituents to thrive and live, you know, happy, healthy, safe lives, right? And we want to ensure that's happening. We might differ on how we get there. But I think making sure you develop that common ground is is so important, and it's so important to do that uh, across the you know across the aisle and across you know the the whole you know political spectrum. So I want to bring it back kind of to the local the mm -hmm. local level. Um, you know a lot of our city councilors yeah. personally. Um, you've met the mayor. You know the mayor. Um, how much does he include the mayor of Somerville? How much do the, does he include? the state delegation in what he's trying to do locally. And he's also head of the Mass Municipal Mayors Association. So yeah. is there a channel that he uses? I mean, pre-pandemic, during pandemic is a little different, but yeah. how closely involved is the entire delegation in what he needs and what he wants? Yeah, no, I mean, I think we're, we're you know, definitely in touch regularly, right? Especially around all the important local issues. So just to give an example, right, GLX is something we, as a delegation, right, tackle all the home rule petitions. It's very important that we're all on the same page about that, as well as, you know, just even over the past month, right, the short time I've been here, you know, I've been in touch with the mayor's office to, you know, just figure out, hey, what's going on with the vaccine rollout? You know, is what is what I'm reading in the paper, right, and I know about online, is that matching up with what you're, you're experiencing? Like, is there anything else that you need me to know about particularly at this local level, so that when I go and testify or advocate or write letters to the governor, um, that I have those questions ready that is informed by, you know, what's going on at the city level. And I think that's where, you know, city and, uh, sorry, municipal and, and state government really um, meet, right, is that we, we want to make sure we're on the same page and largely with all these issues that's been coming up um, around COVID-19, the vaccine and, and reopening schools, we're on the same team about this, right? Like, I mean, we need to make sure that the governor's administration is communicating with Somerville on what they're, you know, have, you know, asking them to do or, you know, what mandates they put out. Um, and we're finding that that communication hasn't been between the, you know, governor's administration and municipalities hasn't been great. I mean, to put it really frankly. Well, it's, I, you we know, it's, ve it's yeah. very clear from the public statements that the mayor of Somerville yeah. is making is that he is extremely frustrated oh, yeah. with it's, some what's happening at the administ Baker administration. Yeah, um, absolutely. And that will inevitably filter to our state delegation, mm -hmm. right? That's People right. will say, well, you know, the mayor needs help from the state delegation. Mm -hmm. What are they doing to get Charlie Baker to understand that we can probably administer a lot of these things better yeah. than you can at the state level? Absolutely. So just, yeah. just not defending Charlie Baker, not defending Joe Curtitoni, just saying 
These are business relationships that people have. Yeah. And if you continue to criticize, he may get to the point where he said, well, you know what, Joe? I'm satisfying 70% of the state. Um, that's just an observation. On my yeah. Part. No, but it's, yeah, but it is, you know, I think the communication piece has been, you know, I empathize a lot with the, the, the mayor's administration right now because it has been really challenging, right? When we find out first on the news, right? Rather than being like, hey, heads up guys, you know, your phones are gonna go off over this announcement we're putting out. You know, it's just little things like that, I think is something that, you know, we just have to keep saying, look, you, you gotta do better on that front. Um, and it, so is, it is gonna require a lot of patience and it's gonna require a lot of understanding from mm -hmm. anybody who's in the decision-making process yeah. um, to have patience with those who don't understand mm -hmm. the decision-making process. I want to move into uh, very quickly your mm -hmm. thoughts on school reopening. Somerville mm -hmm. has targeted March 4th for the yep. beginning of the rollout. Yep. Thoughts, uh, thoughts from your level? Yeah, I mean, I think what um, the school committee, um, the mayor's administration and the, you know, the teachers unions that deal that they hashed out, right, which I believe had an over 90% support by, by educators. Um, and it was an incredible, I mean, best in the nation, probably, I mean, best in the state, but I would say probably one of the best in the nation plan, right, to safely reopen schools. Because for me, the top priority is safety for our students, for our educators. You know, I mean, a lot of educators have multi, you know, and students as well, right, have multi-generational households, right, who, who have, could get very, um, who are in a very bad situation if they were exposed to the virus. And we really need to be mindful of, you know, everyone's needs around that. And I think that that deal that they hashed out was, again, one of the best in the country, really had some of the highest standards. Um, and then, you know, I think when Governor Baker came out this week saying, scratch all that, this is what you're doing. I mean, that's just an example, right? Where again, there was that lack of communication to say, hey, look, we, we've actually figured out a deal here. You know, we don't need you to tell us like, where, right. when to and do what, and we want to make sure the buildings are, you know, safe to open. It's called, it's called throwing the fly into the ointment. Right, yeah. exactly. You know, yeah. so, so, you know, yeah. I do feel, I feel for the educators, the parents, the students, mm -hmm. the yeah. administration, um, but you know, these are going to be ongoing conversations because the virus is here. And it doesn't look like it's going away quickly. So mm -hmm. we're going to have to be flexible. We're going to have to be patient. Um, have I scared you off from coming on the <laughs> state delegation update? Or can I count on you coming back in the coming weeks? Oh, you can, you can count on me anytime. You're, you're always, the door's always open. <laughs> Excellent. Unfortunately, Erica, we're running out of time. Yeah. So I want to thank you for your um, cooperation and your patience with getting you on here. I know that all of you do arm wrestling to try to get on the show. Between you, Mike Conley, Christine Barber, Senator Jalen, um, we will see you in, uh, in the not too distant future, but thank you for coming on today. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for the Somerville Media Center. I'm Joe Lynch. As always, please stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.